In the moment of um, confidence um, in 1968, Tony Cliff, who, with whom I was fairly close at that time, um, said to me, I wish Chris Harmon was my son. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there was a reason for that. <laughs> Up to 1968, those of you who, some of you were around, but not very many, um, the, the International Socialist Organization was not, in fact, a quote-unquote, a Leninist organization. I spent five years, I think, between 1962 and 1967, arguing with the previous speaker, Ian Virtual, that we didn't need a party. <laughs> um, he was right about that, if not about anything else. <laughs> Uh, Rosa Luxemburg, uh, Cliff's book, Rosa Luxemburg, which was published in 1960 and which we were still reading in 1967, um, said in the discussion of political party organization that Rosa Luxemburg was a much better guy than Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. The emphasis in our organization was on workers' spontaneity and creativity, not on the need for an iron-hard, steel-hard, uh, whatever you like, Bolshevik organization. That emphasis on spontaneity and creativity wasn't a bad way in to become a revolutionary, but of course it wasn't an adequate position. And that was really proved to everybody, I think, who was, who'd been a member of the IS in May 1968, when it proved, uh, what, what happened was that the French left proved too small and too weak to stop the French Communist Party from first containing and then ending the biggest mass strike up to then in world history. The response of our organization to that, and of Cliff in particular, was to do an abrupt about turn. But it, if you look at, I'm, I'm hoping that Ian in his biography will discuss this, initially the position for a Leninist organization was not very well argued. Cliff produced two, two, two sides of a piece of paper, um, which created turmoil in the organization. The IS split into five factions, and we had to have two conferences in the autumn of 1968 to try and resolve the organizational question. There was an enormous amount of confusion, an enormous amount of daftness, as well as a very exciting debate that was going on about what Marxist politics about. And then in December 9th of 1968, in the International Socialism Journal, there appeared an article by Chris Harmony called simply Party and Clubs. And at the time, it was a revelation to an awful lot of comrades, and myself included. Chris drew on Gramsci, uh, somebody who nobody in the IS really was reading, I think, at the time, um, as well as on Lenin, and re he read Luxembourg very carefully. And he helped settle the, or the issue in the organization. And it put Chris from then on, really, firmly in the intellectual leadership of the International Socialists. Now, I think party in class was really an important founding document of our organization from 1968 onwards. And the message of that, of that, of that, of that little pamphlet, or article, republished over and over again as a pamphlet and elsewhere, is firstly that it's a mistake to think, as the Social Democrats did, and as the Stalinists did, that the party represents the working class. <coughs> it's a mistake to think that socialism is our party or any other party coming to power. First, Chris asserted, as we had always done, that for Marxism, the slogan of Marx and Engels still remained valid. The emancipation of the working class can only be conquered by the working class itself. In a socialist revolution, the workers themselves will have to build new democratic institutions called the Commune in 1871, called the Soviet in 1917, called the Workers' Council in Germany in 1918, and in other places in the world thereafter. And there's still its own democratic institutions. That's the core of the idea of socialist revolution. But there's a practical political problem that Chris faced up to, and which has been revealed again and again in the great popular movements of the last century. And that is that movements of the working class are never homogeneous. They're always uneven. The working class is never a unified political actor. Never. 
Never, never will be, never has been. It's always full of different tendencies and uh, what was one say, currents, as it were. All from a militant vanguard at one end to the most reactionary worst types at the other. There's always a, a movement is what is a, has an interior life of argument and of majorities and minorities. And therefore, faced with that situation, there are two possible responses. <coughs> one was the response of many of the left, then and since, which is essentially one of fatalism, to bow down to confusion, not least the confusion created by social democrats, Stalinists, bourgeois parties and bourgeois media, and so on. Or the alternative, organize, try and intervene, try and actively argue for better strategies, argue to win. And it was a view of movements as arenas of debate and argument in which the effectiveness of the socialist voice depends on the organization of the most advanced sections, the need for them to get together, to formulate a way forward for the whole movement and argue for it. That's what Chris explained, the, the central issue of party and class was about. It wasn't to say it was easy, as he pointed out, but that was the only politics that could possibly transcend the politics of Rosa Luxemburg, with, with which really we held up to 1968. And Chris held to that position firmly for the rest of his great political life. He taught thousands of the centre of that politics, and I, for one, and I think everybody, most of the people in this room, I will agree that we remember him for that was the core of all of this politics. Thank you.